Hello, and welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center Livable Communities webinar series. Today's webinar is entitled Selection of Pedestrian Treatments at Unsignalized Crossings with Charlie Zagir, Director of the PBIC. My name is Jeremy Pinkham, and I am the Communication Coordinator for PBIC and the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Attendees, if you can hear me, Click the hand in the box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen to raise your hand so we can be sure our audience can hear us. Okay, we're getting some uh, positive responses. That's a good sign. Um, before we get started with today's webinar, I want to go over a few administrative details and the functionality of the webinar software. If for some reason your computer or web browser freezes during the webinar, please reload the website and log back into the program. You'll be able to rejoin the session. Please note that attendees will not be able to speak during the webinar. We do expect a large number of attendees on this call, so by muting your audio, it helps us to cut down on confusion and background noise. Let us take a look at this slide that shows the webinar interface. As an attendee, you have a control box in the upper right uh, corner of your screen that collapses and expands by clicking the arrow button. Though you won't be able to speak, you will have the ability to ask questions by entering them in the question box here. If you have a problem during the webinar, you may enter it here, and I'll monitor these questions and respond to you if I'm able. Questions pertaining to the presentation may be asked at any time in the question box, but will not be addressed until the end of the program, when we have built in about 20 minutes for a discussion period. Please feel free to ask those questions as we go along, and we'll get to them after the presentation. Also, so that you, so that you are not alarmed when you exit the webinar, I want to let you know that a very brief survey will open up after you leave. We would very much appreciate your feedback on our performance. Before we get started with today's program, I want to give everyone a little information about what this webinar is about. The goal of the Livable Communities webinar series is to better enable our audience to improve the quality of life in their communities by promoting safe walking and bicycling as a viable means of transportation and physical activity. The bi-monthly series was developed by the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center, the National Clearinghouse of Pedestrian and Bicycle-Related Safety Information and Resources. PBIC and today's webinar are both made possible with funding from the U.S. Department of Transportation's Federal Highway Administration. The next Livable Communities webinar will be held on Thursday, March 18th, from 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be presented by Dr. Jillian Hutz and David Parisi who will speak on Community Approaches to Pedestrian Safety Education. The registration link is now live and can be found at walkinginfo.org slash webinars. There, you will also be able to access an archived recording and transcript of today's program after the live webinar. It usually takes about a week to get everything posted. In addition to these webinars, PBIC offers four different in-person training courses to provide technical assistance to professionals and community members in developing pedestrian safety action plans and improving conditions for walking. These courses can be found at walkinginfo.org slash training. If we are not able to get to your question at the end of the presentation, please do not hesitate to contact us. All of our web resources can be accessed at pedbikeinfo.org, and you may reach me at any time at webinars at hsrc.unc.edu or by calling 919-843-4859. Um, in a second, I'm going to turn this over to Charlie Zagir for the future presentation on the selection of pedestrian treatments at unsignalized crossings. Um, while he's getting set up with this slide presentation, I want to take a quick poll from the audience. Please let us know how many participants are viewing the webinar at your site. And uh, while you're completing this poll, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our speaker. Charlie Zagir is director of the PBIC and is associate director of engineering and planning at the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. He has taught courses on pedestrian and roadway safety throughout the US over the past 25 years. He has been principal investigator and primary report author on numerous federal studies and guides, including the FHWA Guide, How to Develop a Pedestrian Safety Action Plan, and the NCHRP Report, A Guide for Reducing Collisions Involving Pedestrians, both of which can be found in the PBIC online library. Uh, I'd like to welcome and thank Charlie for his presentation today. Uh, I'm going to close this poll now. 
thank you everyone for um, submitting your answers. And uh, Charlie, please take it from here. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. I'd like to uh, thank Jeremy and uh, Katie Jones of the PBIC for uh, all the work they put into organizing these uh, webinars, and to uh, Gabe Rousseau of the Federal Highway Administration uh, for allowing us to uh, uh, have these webinars as part of the Pedestrian Bike Information Center activities. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today uh, really covers a topic of pedestrian safety that uh, is fairly uh, uh, confusing to a lot of agencies. Um, oftentimes, it's unclear how to solve a problem at an unsignalized or what we call an uncontrolled crossing location. So uh, while we don't have all the answers, we are going to look at some of the information that we're aware of from the research, uh, from the current guidelines, and uh, also from the latest version of the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices that was just approved um, uh, in late December. Okay, so let's see if this is going to advance. Uh -huh. We're going to cover this in two parts. The first part is going to be on general principles of pedestrian crossing. And then we're going to talk about some of the countermeasures to address some of the crash issues. OK, <laughs> I'm getting a strange pop-up. But the first question is, you know, why do people cross the street? And, and there are many different reasons um, uh, on all kinds of locations, all types and ages of pedestrians. And so as um, uh, engineers, planners of the roadway environment, we really need to uh, be able to take a close look at some of the uh, problems and issues that are going on, uh, particularly that cause pedestrian crashes. We know that pedestrians shouldn't have to run across the street, as you can see these uh, two teenagers here. Um, you can see with their backs to traffic, it really uh, puts them at a, a high-risk situation. And some people say, well, ideally we'd like to have um, traffic signals at all of our crossing locations. And while that may seem to be a good solution, it's not, not always practical, nor does it necessarily guarantee safety for pedestrians. And in particular, we know that many of our pedestrian crash problems are at signalized intersections uh, or signalized mid-block places. So uh, there are many other uh, answers that may be appropriate for dealing with uh, pedestrian crossings besides just putting in traffic signals. And we know that even if we could put in signals, that it would really not solve the problem. And in fact, it would create other huge problems. Uh, we know that many intersections that are signalized have more crashes than before they were signalized. The people that are crossing mid-block uh, are not, not criminals. You know, they're just trying to find ways to uh, deal with the roadway situation uh, where they are. We know that behavior of pedestrian varies, so that when we really go try to come up with solutions, um, we need to be aware of the different behaviors, try to figure out why they're happening, uh, and then take action to uh, reduce the risk for the crossings. All right, let's look at a few principles for pedestrian crossings. Uh, let's make the assumption that pedestrians want and need to be able to cross the street safely. We know that uh, drivers need to understand pedestrians' uh, uh, intention, and pedestrians need to understand what drivers are doing. Uh, there's a, I was told about an accident in, or a crash in the state of Maine a few years ago when a young boy was struck by a, a gentleman in a pickup truck. And fortunately, the uh, child was not hurt seriously, uh, but the officer interviewed him in the hospital. And he asked the boy if he, why he crossed the street in front of the truck. Didn't he see the driver? And the boy said, yes, I, I looked, saw the driver, saw that he saw me, so I assumed he was going to stop for me. And so the police officer asked the driver, well, didn't you see the boy? And the driver said, yes, I saw the boy and saw that he saw me, so I assumed he was going to wait for me. So oftentimes, it's not even a matter of seeing the pedestrian. It's a matter of understanding the intent um, uh, of the other road user and how to, to cross safely or how, as a driver, uh, you're supposed to behave you know, to uh, uh, reduce pedestrian cr uh, crashes. Another principle is that we want to try to keep our crossing short. Uh, roadway crossings that are 
four, five, six lanes often result in excessive exposure time for the pedestrians in the street. It increases the risk of a pedestrian uh, motorist conflict or collision. It increases delay to the motorist and certainly to the pedestrian. And many pedestrians, especially older or younger pedestrians, have difficulty even getting across. The other issue on speed um, is speed, which relates to several different uh, consequences. Number one, higher speed reduces the driver's field of vision. Secondly, it reduces the ability of the driver to react and avoid a crash. And third, higher speeds result in higher uh, uh, likelihood of death. So you can see here in this slide <coughs> a motorist that's going down a roadway at a fairly low rate of speed. This is 15 miles an hour. Uh, has a fairly broad uh, field of vision. So they can see you know, people, bicyclists, pedestrians on both sides fairly easily. As the speed increases here to 20, you can see the field of vision starts to decrease. And at 25, it decreases further. At 30, now the driver is really looking more on the horizon. Uh, so you get the picture. The, what you see here is the relationship in this next slide of uh, the uh, effects of increased speed on driver reaction and braking distance. So you can see at 10 miles an hour, a driver is able to react and stop in about 50 feet. And as you increase in speed, for example, up to 40 miles an hour, uh, if you add in the distance that it takes, uh, time and distance, for a driver to perceive the pedestrian and put the front on the brake and come to a complete stop, it can be 350 feet or more. So obviously, as, as you know, the uh, uh, distance for stopping for a pedestrian greatly increases uh, as speeds are higher. And also in this next slide, you can see the relationship between the probability of death and vehicle speed. This shows, for example, that if a motorist is going 20 miles an hour and strikes a pedestrian, there's about a 15% chance that the pedestrian will die. If that speed is increased to 30 miles an hour, the probability goes up to about half or 45%. If the driver goes still 10 miles faster at 40 miles an hour uh, and strikes a pedestrian, the chance of death is more like 85%. So speed kills. And uh, we can certainly reduce a lot of pedestrian crashes and the severity of those crashes if we can do something to the roadway environment or educate the driver to slow down. OK, we also know that there are some traffic calming measures that we can talk about along a corridor, along a route, um, a collector street, for example, uh, such as curb extensions, um, or anything you can do to sort of narrow the effective width of the street to uh, slow down vehicle speeds, which can also reduce the chance of collision, obviously, at the crossings themselves. OK, the other, the other principle, and we put this in because it's sort of a, a fact of, of most people, that uh, they are most likely to just cross where it's most convenient for them, that we find that very few pedestrians are willing to. Uh, just one second. It looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Um, I think we're going to need to uh, uh, reload the PowerPoint in just one second, OK? Please bear with us here for a minute. Yeah, while Jeremy's doing that, um, if you all would go ahead uh, and type in any questions that you are hoping to have answered as part of this webinar. And uh, then as we proceed, Jeremy will be looking at the questions, and he'll be writing these down, and then we'll have them ready uh, when the uh, main presentation is over. And I will just, if you just want to begin again, Charlie, and I'll find the, the slide where we were at. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. OK, one of the things, as you get in the slides up, uh, the one of the key points that I wanted to uh, bring up for the webinar today, and we are going to go over a lot of different strategies, uh, but that it's so important that you know, we really try to look at every crossing individually and also as a system so that we're trying to uh, diagnose specific safety problems, crash problems, uh, but also looking at all of our uh, pedestrian crossings uh, throughout our city or town or county to make sure that we have sort of an overall plan on how we identify potential problems as well as uh, sites that have had pedestrian crashes and try to deal with them uh, in, a, in a, a logical, systematic manner. OK, so can they see the slides? OK. 
I just can't see them on my screen. Okay. All right. Well, uh, can hope, hope everybody can see the slides now. Um, basically, uh, there are traffic calming measures, as we were saying, that can slow down vehicles along a corridor and therefore reduce the, the uh, safety at the crossings themselves. Okay. Um, principle five is that pedestrians will cross where it's most convenient for them and not to expect them to go far out of their way. Uh, and that if they are crossing at a given location, like at a mid-block uh, spot, that we want to see why they're crossing there and then see if we can make the crossing uh, reasonably safe. Or if it's close enough to a signal, then, then it might be appropriate to direct them to a nearby signalized crossing. Okay. The question about mid-block versus intersection, uh, and I know that you've probably heard people say, oh, always go across at the intersection, it's safer. Well, some of the research we've done says that's not necessarily the case, that uh, it, it really is more a function of the number of lanes, the vehicle speed, and, and the uh, vehicle volume in terms of you know, where it's relatively safe to cross the street, uh, that we can have uh, pedestrians crossing mid-block uh, that you know, it has the uh, advantage of not ha pedestrians not having to yield or, or worry about turning vehicles. Uh, so it really is more a function of other factors uh, instead of whether it's mid-block or intersection. Okay, let's get into some of the countermeasures and talk about uh, some of the pros and cons of each and where they may be uh, best suited to be implemented on your roadway system. We are going to go through and talk about things like uh, crosswalks, illumination at the crossing, uh, different kinds of signs, uh, marking crosswalk uh, markings, for example, raised medians and pedestrian islands, uh, traffic signals with different uh, pedestrian options if warranted, and overpasses, underpasses. Okay, uh, here's a cartoon uh, taken from the newspaper that says, um, Biggerville's new pedestrian monkey bars not only reduce accidents, but also whip people into great shape. Uh, now, so this kind of shows that, you know, it's, this is sort of a lighthearted attempt to indicate, uh, you know, how we can get pedestrians safely across the street. And I think a lot of uh, citizens out there realize that, you know, it's not always an easy thing or a safe thing to try to just do a basic street crossing. Uh, but this is not something we recommend. Uh, we're going to be getting into some other countermeasures that, uh, however. Uh, for example, one of the other questions that comes up often is marked crosswalks. You know, you know, why are they marked? When should you mark them? Uh, how does marking a crosswalk affect the risk for pedestrians? Does it create this false sense of security that some people talk about? And so the question here that asks why are crosswalks provided um, there are two main reasons. Number one, to indicate to pedestrians where they should cross, uh, maybe a preferred crossing location, not necessarily safer, but a preferred location. Number two, to indicate to drivers where they might expect pedestrians. So it's just a, sort of a, a notice to drivers. And um, in terms of how do you determine where to mark a crosswalk, uh, there's a lot of research and, and debate that's gone on on this question for many decades. Um, and what I'm going to read you now is basically taken right from the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Um, so, I don't know, um, can I be able to see the whole screen? I can't read all that. Sorry. Okay, basically the uh, uh, most recent version of the MUTCD uh, just came out uh, actually the middle of January, uh, a few days ago, uh, but it was finished in late 2009, and it basically said crosswalk markings provide guidance for pedestrians who are crossing roadways def by defining and delineating paths on approaches to and within signalized intersections and on approaches to other intersections where traffic stops. Uh, okay, now, now gets into the unsignalized part. It is in conjunction with signs and other measures, crosswalk markings help to alert road users of a designated pedestrian crossing point along the roadway and locations that are not controlled by traffic control signals or stop or yield signs. Crosswalk lines should not be used indiscriminately. Okay, so that, that's some of the basic language. I just copied that out, out of the new MUTCD. It's on the uh, Federal Highway Administration website. But, but the other thing that I thought was kind of interesting, and I tagged that at the bottom, and it says an engineering study should be performed before a marked crosswalk is installed at a location away from a traffic signal or an approach controlled by a stop or yield sign. So this is saying that we shouldn't just go out and put marked crosswalks everywhere, uh, particularly where there's not a signal or a stop sign. We need to do a study to make sure it's the right thing to do. Okay. Now, 
so the question, next question is, how do you determine where to mark a crosswalk? And certainly there are several ways to do that. One of the most obvious uh, uh, things here, and I hope you can see the arrows, <laughs> but it says, in this case, apartments are close to the bus stop and stores, uh, across from the bus stops and stores. So you know people are going to come out of their apartments and need to cross the street to take the bus or to, to buy the groceries. And so it's an obvious place to connect origins and destinations. So you can see here they do have a marked crosswalk uh, across a five-lane road with a raised median island, uh, and a pedestrian is crossing there. They have overhead pedestrian crossing sign. Um, so the question is, you know, is, is can we look at these places uh, where pedestrians need to cross the street and try to accommodate them? Now, we know many locations are not suitable for just putting in the marked crosswalk by itself. This is an example. You have a, uh, looks like about a five-lane road, uh, looks to be very high speed, high volume. There's no real clear location where pedestrians are going to want to cross. They may want to cross anywhere along here at the uh, McDonald's or the Wendy's you can see on the left or some of the uh, other businesses along this route. So there's not a defined crossing point uh, that would make sense to put a marked crosswalk. Here's another location that would not be good for a marked crosswalk. Uh, it shows a horizontal curve, very sharp horizontal curve uh, with poor sight distance. Uh, and actually, uh, some agency has put in a crosswalk uh, that is probably not a very good place to do that because motors are not going to be necessarily expecting pedestrians as they uh, approach from e either direction. There are, however, many locations that would make sense, just common sense would say, it's probably a good place for a marked crosswalk. Here's the location uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, it's a, a two-lane road, looks to be a fairly low-speed street uh, that connects sort of a major entrance to some kind of building uh, to another uh, driveway entrance. And it's right at the back of two bus stop locations. So you can see that people that would be wanting to take the bus might be wanting to cross here. And the crossing is uh, appropriately located behind the bus. So the people would get off the bus, walk to the back of the bus, and then cross in the marked crosswalk. So that's a very suitable, logical place to put a marked crosswalk. Here's another one. <clears throat> this is <clears throat> excuse me, a crossing near the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. And they have, uh, again, it's a fairly low speed, narrow two-lane road. It's a very wide marked crosswalk. Uh, you can see there are tons of pedestrians crossing in both directions, maybe going to the museums. And um, so this, this would be a, an appropriate place to put a marked crosswalk. You don't need a traffic signal. It doesn't warrant a traffic signal. OK, the next slide asks, do marked crosswalks increase safety or encourage people to cross without looking? Uh, which was, is a lot of the uh, basis for some debate over the years. A few years ago, we did a study. Um, and actually, we finished in 2002. Uh, it was called the safety effects of marked versus unmarked crosswalks at uncontrolled locations. And for this study, the idea was to try to look at you know, what are the crash risks associated with uh, unsignalized crossings that have marked crosswalks versus, versus those that don't. So we looked at about 2,000 uh, crossing locations, 1,000 marked, and each of those had a uh, nearby unmarked control site. Uh, so we wanted to do the comparison. Uh, we collected traffic volume, pedestrian volume, a number of lanes, speed limit, uh, uh, other characteristics of the crossings, and then tried to develop a model that would help us understand what are the factors associated with pedestrian crash risk including whether it's marked or not. The bottom line, without going in, into the details of the study, is we found that for roads less than three lanes, mostly two-lane roads, uh, there was no significant difference in pedestrian crash rates, whether it was marked or unmarked, when you, when you control for all the other exposure and other factors. However, when you're on a roadway with three or more lanes, there's no difference in the crash risks for marked and unmarked as long as your traffic volume is less than about 12,000 vehicles a day. Does that make sense? OK. Also, for the multi-lane roads that have more than 12,000 vehicles a day and no median, pedestrian crash risks increase for marked crosswalks. And similarly, if the roadway <coughs> is multi-lane with a raised median and greater than 15,000 vehicles a day, pedestrian crash rate increases. Okay, some of the other things we found in the study <clears throat> are that 
we found that on multi-lane roads, <clears throat> excuse me, that having a raised median reduces pedestrian crashes about 40 percent. A fairly major finding. We also found that for older pedestrians, uh, over 65, they are overrepresented in crashes on all types of roadways. So th this is something to keep in mind as we go think about selecting countermeasures. Uh, we also found as part of a related study that pedestrians were not less vigilant in these marked crosswalks. They weren't you know, doing crazy things because the crosswalk was marked. Uh, we found that there are some other factors associated <clears throat> with, the, with the increased crash risk in marked crosswalks. We're going to talk about some of those. Okay. Um, first of all, the study found that there was increased pedestrian crashes where you had a greater number of lanes and a greater traffic volume. Okay, that's kind of something we, we would have suspected. And other studies have found the same result. But here's one of the key uh, factors that we found that was, that was associated with higher pedestrian crash rates in marked crosswalks. It's what we call the multiple threat crash. And at locations that had marked crosswalks, you're much more likely to have this kind of event, where the first vehicle in, in the curb lane stops that's a pedestrian cross, but the pedestrian may not be able to see around that first vehicle, may not see that second car coming. And likewise, the driver of the second vehicle doesn't see the pedestrian, and so you have a collision. So the, uh, this, this is what we found that was uh, maybe set up by having the marked crosswalk, which encourages the first vehicle to stop in the first place. Okay, the uh, other conclusions from our study uh, are kind of summarized here. We've kind of gone through them, but uh, basically we came up with some guidelines recommending where you should or shouldn't just use marked crosswalks alone. And uh, again, two-lane roads is okay. Uh, Multi-lane uh, roads with low volumes are okay. Uh, however, if you get into speeds greater than 40 miles an hour, that can create problems with motorists uh, being able to stop for pedestrians uh, in the crossing. So, so there, if you have greater speeds, you may need to consider something uh, you know, much more substantial, like considering whether a signal is warranted. OK, again, raise medians, reduce crash risk. And uh, when you do have these multi-lane, higher volume situations, this is where we really need to think broader about more than just paint alone. We need to think about you know, what are some more substantial treatments to make it safe for pedestrians across the street. Okay. Now, it's not okay to just say, well, why don't we just take out all the marked crosswalks and be done with it? Because that doesn't create the, uh, the problem that pedestrians are having in the first place. We need to think about what they need to cross safely. Okay, okay next slide. Uh, and it, this actually is uh, taken directly from the new uh, MUTCD. I actually uh, had it copied yesterday. It basically uh, goes along with our findings of our report. It says, new marked crosswalks alone, without other measures designed to reduce traffic speed, shorten crossing distance, enhance driver awareness of the crossing, and or provide active warning of pedestrian presence should not be installed across uncontrolled roadways where the speed limit exceeds 40 miles an hour, and either A, the roadway has four or more lanes of travel without a raised median or a pedestrian refuge island and an ADT of 12,000 uh, per day or greater, or B, the roadway has four or more lanes of travel with a raised median or a pedestrian refuge island, an ADT of 15,000 or greater. So it's, it's sort of a combination of number of lanes and traffic volume, where you need to sort of be sensitive to uh, where it's okay to just put paint alone, or whether you, where you need more substantial improvements, like on the higher volume multi-lane roads. Okay, so let's talk about some of these other treatments. What else could be implemented, say, in conjunction with uh, marked crosswalks or other crossing treatments? We're going to talk about the things in this list. A proper location, high visibility markings, illumination, signing, advanced stop bars, median islands, curb extensions, and signals. Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier that it's not okay just to say, let's take out all the crosswalks and we solve the problem. And uh, the example I like to use is if, if you go into a doctor's office and you have a broken arm, and the doctor says, well, you've got a broken arm, aspirin alone won't cure it, so I'm going to do nothing. That's kind of like taking out the mark crosswalks and, and doing nothing. What's really needed for the broken arm is to do something more substantial. We need to uh, set the bone, 
put the cast on, and then maybe give you the aspirin too. In other words, it needs a, a combination of, of, of treatments to solve that broken arm problem. Just like a pedestrian crossing on a five or six lane road with high volumes and speeds, it's not enough to just say, we're going to just take out the crosswalk and be done with it. We really need to look at something uh, more substantial. Okay, so first of all, let's just talk about the paint. Uh, marking a crosswalk like this, it looks kind of like it's uh, a few years old. Uh, it's kind of worn and cracked. A pedestrian can see it just fine. Uh, so a pedestrian would say, yes, this is a marked crosswalk. But the next slide here shows what the driver sees. The driver uh, cannot see the marked crosswalk. It's virtually invisible to the driver in this case. So, you know, this is something that we need to just be aware of and when we think about treatments. Okay, this slide shows three different options for a crosswalk uh, application. The first one at the top is just a parallel line that, that we often see in most uh, crossings. The one in the middle is what we call the, the uh, continental style or high visibility, and the one on the bottom we call the ladder style, which is also a high visibility uh, crosswalk type. And obviously the research shows that the, the middle and bottom crosswalk markings are much easier to see uh, by motorists uh, in particular as well as pedestrians. Okay, this is a slide showing the longitudinal markings uh, with the transverse uh, markings, which are very visible. Uh, the pedestrian is crossing there. The drivers can see it with no problem. It's supplemented with, uh, these are the older pedestrian warning signs. The next slide here, you can see also the you know, high visibility crosswalks. <clears throat> uh, these are actually positioned uh, to avoid the uh, wheel tracks to reduce wear and tear on the uh, paint itself. So uh, we've talked to cities like Orlando that have kind of gone with this pattern as a standard. Um, just it, it is more expensive to apply these crosswalks, but they last much, much longer than the parallel lines. And they position the uh, markings to uh, reduce wear and tear because the wheels travel between the, uh, the markings. This is a, a, a photo showing uh, a driver's view as they approach the uh, high visibility uh, crosswalk. Uh, several hundred feet ahead, but it's very visible because of uh, the additional paint. Uh, this is in a school zone. This slide shows sort of what a driver may see at night uh, for pedestrians crossing in a marked crosswalk. It's difficult to see uh, uh, the pedestrians, uh, even the ones in white. Uh, and remember, many pedestrians are, are walking at night. Maybe they've had a, a, a drink or two, <laughs> wearing black clothing. And uh, under those conditions, motors are just not able to see and react to pedestrians uh, in many cases, particularly when they're going more than about 25 or 30 miles an hour. So we need to think about what can we do for pedestrian crossing sites to, to uh, make pedestrians more visible to motorists. Obviously, lighting is something that uh, we would recommend to be considered at all, uh, you know, mark pedestrian crossings. Uh, and we know from some of the literature that uh, up to 50% of pedestrian crashes occur at night. And this is sort of a, a typical uh, application where, where the lighting is installed above the marked crosswalk. But there is new research uh, out nowadays uh, that, that, first of all, documents the uh, crash reduction from improved lighting to be about 42% in at mid-block locations and about a 54% reduction in pedestrian crashes uh, at intersections where the lighting has been dramatically improved. This is a report we're showing here. It's called Informational Report on Lighting Design for Mid-Block Crosswalks. It was published in April of 2008 by the Federal Highway Administration, that you may want to get a hold of it if you haven't seen it. But it really gives some pretty good recommendations for how we should go about lighting our, uh, our crosswalks. Uh, this slide shows sort of a, uh, the old way and the new way. Uh, the, the figure 11 on the left shows the traditional mid-block crossing uh, lighting layout that does show the, the light pole right directly over the crosswalk. But we know now that uh, drivers can't see pedestrians very well when, when the light is directly overhead. Uh, it doesn't really even cast, uh, cast a very good shadow. Whereas in the, the uh, figure 12 on the right, it shows uh, one light on either side of the marked crosswalk. And this makes the pedestrian much more visible to the motorist at night because one light shines so, so the light reflects back to the driver and the other one uh, as well. So it gives a much better perspective uh, at night of the pedestrian for the motorist. 
Okay, and this uh, last figure on lighting shows sort of the traditional way with the lighting sort of in each quadrant uh, versus uh, the upper right, which shows the, the new design for intersection lighting that we talked about with the uh, lights in front of the, the uh, Mark Crosswalk. The sketch in the bottom center uh, would be for the uh, wide multi-lane roads, where you'd also <coughs> implement a light in the median so that uh, for the uh, major approaches, there'd be a light on uh, uh, each side of the, uh, of the approach, covering both lanes. Okay, other kinds of treatments for pedestrian crossings. Upper left-hand corner, these, this is on pedestrian warning signs. The upper left shows the old way with the pedestrian symbol in the, uh, in the marked crosswalk. The new way that in, on the lower left uh, that you can implement sort of the pedestrian warning sign with a down arrow indicating to the driver that the crosswalk is here. <laughs> and uh, with the uh, advanced pedestrian warning sign that shows the pedestrian symbol with the word ahead. So this is sort of the new guideline in the MUTCD. Okay, in-street pedestrian crossing signs. Uh, there's really two different uh, varieties we show you here. Um, some people refer to these as the knockdown signs <laughs> for obvious reasons, because trucks or cars sometimes run over them and knock them down. Uh, but that's not uh, the ideal. We want them to stand there and so motorists can see that, uh, in this case, it says state law, yield to pedestrians within crosswalk. Uh, and that would be appropriate for states that have the uh, uh, yield uh, requirement in the law. The other sign for states that say motorists must stop for pedestrians in crosswalk is the other sign, the one on the upper right, that says state law stop for pedestrians within crosswalk. So these are variations of signing. Uh, we've actually evaluated these as some of our research for Federal Highway. We have found that uh, installing these signs, particularly on low-speed downtown two-lane roads, uh, does result in an increase in motorist yielding uh, to pedestrians, uh, fairly dramatic, from less than 15 or 20 percent up to as high as about 60 or 65 percent. Of course, the, the downside is it's still not 100 percent yielding. Uh, now, I'm not particularly one to recommend a sign like this on the multi-lane roads, you know, four, five, and six-lane roads until those have been fully researched and evaluated. But on the low volume, low speed, two lane roads, at least our research indicates that they can Im improve motorist yielding behavior. Okay, the next device, now this one we call the rectangular rapid flash LED beacon. Um, it received interim approval for the MUTCD uh, with its own separate warrants, but it's not uh, fully adopted within the MUTCD, mainly because of the timing. So if a state wants to apply to FHWA to get this approved for uh, implementation statewide, I'm told by someone on the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control, Control Devices that they can just do sort of a blanket uh, request for approval to Federal Highway to have this device uh, uh, implemented you know, within their state. And it, it's a fairly routine thing. Uh, and, it, and it's not even a requirement to uh, do the formal evaluation, although I think you know, more evaluation certainly would be beneficial. Uh, we call it, well, we call this uh, sort of the rectangular uh, rapid flash beacon. Uh, studies by Dr. Ron Van Houten have shown that it can increase motorist yielding behavior from less than 20% in some locations up to more than 80% after this is installed. It does have kind of a sort of a, a rapid flash device you can see between the pedestrian sign and the down arrow. Um, it has uh, really been evaluated at several locations, uh, primarily in Florida, and uh, it gives the warning message, but it's much more noticeable by motorists because of the rapid flash device. Uh, it does have to be activated by pedestrians uh, by pushing the button or by a passive detector. This is sort of a, a photograph in this slide showing that the beacons are really required on both sides of the travel lane. In case it's a multi-lane road, for example, and you're on the right lane behind a truck, uh, you need to be able to see the sign, and it might be hidden if the sign is only on the right side of the road. It will be hidden by the, the truck ahead. So this shows how that, I, that it should be installed on the left end to the right of the, of the driver's view. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about, uh, oh, by the way, that last device uh, has been evaluated for traffic volumes up to about 30,000 uh, vehicles a day or a little more. But uh, it hadn't really been fully evaluated for the really high traffic volume. So we're not sure 
if that's going to be a good solution for the, you know, the, the five and six lane roads carrying, you know, really 50,000 vehicles a day. The next device is fairly low cost. It has been evaluated also uh, in recent years uh, to really try to reduce the risk of this multiple threat crash. Now you can see here, uh, this is kind of a depiction of what we showed you earlier, where this car A, this vehicle one, stops right at the crosswalk. And you can see the pedestrian is stepped out in front, and the pedestrian cannot see that uh, second car, that car B, that's approaching, nor can the driver of car B see that pedestrian yet until it's too late. Okay, so one logical solution which is being used more and more is you can see now we've moved that stop line back. Uh, the MUTCD allows you to move it 20 to 50 feet. Uh, and now, uh, assuming car A stops at that advanced stop line, you can see the uh, visibility distance of car of driver and car B has improved dramatically. Now the pedestrian can see that oncoming vehicle, and either the vehicle will have time to stop for the pedestrian or the pedestrian may have time to take ev evasive action if not. So this can this is a fairly low cost treatment and you say well but how can you get car A to stop at the uh, stop bar? And, and here's the answer. Um, in the MUTCD uh, in the 2003 version it allowed you to use these signs that would say yield here to pedestrian with a down arrow and that sign would go right at the advanced stop line or yield line. The uh, signs on the right say stop here for pedestrian with a down arrow. Now, this was adopted in, in the 2009 MUTCD, uh, again, where the local law says motors must stop for pedestrians instead of yield to pedestrians. Okay, so here's a uh, photograph of sort of a combination of these treatments. You have your uh, high visibility crossing with the pedestrian warning sign, the down arrow, and then on the approach of that crossing, uh, you have uh, they're called yield lines, or the shark's teeth, we call them. Those were in the 2003 MUTCD. And we have the uh, accompanying sign that says, yield here to pedestrians with the down arrow. So this, this is a message to the driver. Uh, you know, this is the place you're supposed to, to stop and yield for that pedestrian to cross. Um, this looks like a, a little close. I think I'd probably recommend moving the shark's teeth back about another 10, 15 feet. But anyway, you, you get the idea. Here's an example of a... Uh, stop line with the stop here for pedestrians uh, down arrow message uh, on the advance of the pedestrian crossing. But without this sign, you know, I'm not sure how many drivers are really going to stop or, you know, at the stop line or the yield line. So you need to have both in combination to optimize your yielding. Okay, here's a, a crossing uh, actually in Las Vegas uh, that illustrates that they've installed the stop line, uh, looks like about 30 feet you know, back from the crosswalk itself. Uh, which really opens up that sight distance. So, I guess in conclusion, summary on the, on the marked crosswalk, when is it okay to mark a crosswalk without other treatments? Again, the two-lane road with less than 40 miles an hour. Also, on the multi-lane roads, the traffic volume is less than about 12,000 vehicles a day if there's no median, or less than 15,000 vehicles a day if there is a median. Okay, medians are always good, but even with a median, you may need something in addition to the marked crosswalks. Um, you know, in those situations. Okay, how can you increase the effectiveness of marked crosswalks? Okay, add a median and advanced stop line. Uh, there's textured crosswalks, and it's best to use white crosswalks when possible. Signs can supplement uh, other marking, and illumination is always recommended uh, where pedestrians are crossing. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about uh, sort of the, along the route that includes mid-block crossings, and many of you may have uh, major roadways where pedestrians are crossing uh, sort of all along that route. There's not one particular crossing point. So one sort of good rule of thumb is if you have a multi-lane road, particularly a road with four lanes or more, uh, if you can put in a raised median or a raised median island along there where pedestrians are crossing, the research uh, shows that you can reduce pedestrian crossing crashes by about 46 percent in marked crosswalks and about almost 40% in unmarked crosswalks. So that's one of the best medicines you can use for pedestrian crossings on multi-lane roads. I know it's not as cheap as, as some other treatments, but it can be really effective. And this kind of shows the illustration of pedestrians uh, crossing with a median. They stop at the curb, look to the left, uh, and all they have to do is get to that median uh, in one crossing uh, period. So as long as it's, uh, traffic is clear to the left, they can cross to the median. Uh, However, if you, and then wait till it's clear to cross to the other side. 
The problem with this flush median, uh, some people call it a suicide lane, uh, but a five lane with no raised median is it really does not function uh, anything like a raised median. And according to our research, it's no safer uh, by having five lanes than four lanes. It doesn't give you the safety benefit of a raised median. So if you add the raised median, this is done by Photoshop, uh, in this case it's got sort of a jag to the right, so motorists, I mean, pedestrians can walk to the median, uh, walk to the right as they're looking for oncoming traffic, waiting for a gap in traffic each side of the street before they cross. Uh, you know, that sort of gives you uh, a sense of, of some, uh, you know, possible options here. And you can see, again, that it does break the crossing into two steps. And there's also the option, you can see a little red arrow maybe showing you how the, uh, the little jag to the right can you know, get you to the median and then pedestrians sort of, uh, you know, angle to the right so they can see they're kind of forced to look at oncoming traffic to their right before they finish the second uh, half of the crossing. So that's also kind of a nice feature. Okay, what about pedestrian signals? You know, everything we've talked about so far has been at where a traffic signal does not exist, uh, no pedestrian signals exist, uh, but it is now easier to meet the minimum pedestrian volume warrant with the new uh, METCD. And this is based partly on some of the research conducted by the Texas Transportation Institute, um, and plus a lot of other information that um, indicates that it's so difficult to meet that old warrant of 190 pedestrians per peak hour or 100 pedestrians per hour in any uh, one of four hours in the day. So that this new warrant really incorporates pedestrian volume and traffic volume. It's, it is much easier to meet that warrant uh, in, under certain conditions. So do go look at the new METCD and see if some of your pedestrian crossings may now meet the warrant, whereas they did not before. Okay, we want to make sure that um, our pedestrians have a hot response, so the pedestrian pushes it. It doesn't take a long time to, to respond. Uh, we, because if it is, pedestrians won't wait that long. They'll cross against the light, and then the light will stop traffic uh, needlessly. And we don't want that to happen. Okay, uh, I'll quickly go over a two-stage crossing, and this is something that may be appropriate in a suburban area, like where you have a bus stop. Um, you can see the overhead traffic signal. The pedestrian pushes the button and uh, stops traffic in the direction uh, from their left. Uh, meanwhile, traffic from, from the other direction keeps going. The pedestrian crosses to the center line uh, on, on the red light. Meanwhile, traffic continues on from, from their right or to our left. Okay, uh, then traffic is released in the first direction the, while the pedestrian walks in the uh, center island over to push the, the button in the median. Uh, traffic continues now in the uh, uh, direction on the right and is stopped in the direction on the left due to the pushing the button. And then uh, as soon as the pedestrian gets across, traffic resumes uh, on the second direction. So you can see what's happened is the delay to pedestrian has been minimized, uh, so the pedestrian just has to push two buttons. Uh, the delay to motorists has been reduced greatly, um, and it does add protection to pedestrians to get to that bus stop uh, or across that wide street when there may not have been adequate gaps before. The requirements here are you have to have the second button in the island, uh, and the island has to be separated uh, so that the uh, uh, walk signal is not directly across the street, because otherwise the pedestrian may just try to go all the way across in one, one step. You do have to have the fence to force the pedestrians to walk um, to the right so they can push the second button and stop traffic uh, coming from their right. Now, the, the next device I want to talk about is um, the Hawk um, signal. Or it's called the pedestrian hybrid beacon. It was initially developed in Tucson uh, for use on high volume, high speed roadways when a full signal was not warranted. Uh, this also is included in the 2009 METCD. And uh, uh, this is what a driver sees. They see just a blank signal uh, when there's no pedestrian there. Pedestrians see a, a blank signal. Push the button, and well, they see, I'm sorry, a red hand when the button has not been activated. And uh, I'm not sure if this is flashing on your screen, but uh, after the button is pushed, it goes to a flashing yellow in number two, then a steady yellow in number three, and there's still a hand message for the pedestrian. Number four, now the drivers see that the two uh, red signals, and the pedestrian gets a walk signal uh, with time enough for the pedestrian to get to the island. And then it goes to the flashing red, or the, the wigwag for the uh, motorist, and the pedestrian gets a flashing hand. 
So for motors, it means you've got to stop, but if it's clear of pedestrians, then you can stop and proceed. And then it goes back to the, uh, to the blank out in the red hand. In the red hand. Okay, so it's really a different uh, signal sequence than uh, normal pedestrian uh, signals. Okay, we're kind of on the last stage. We're going to talk a little bit about overpasses and underpasses. And uh, as you know, in theory, grade separation you know, should result in no conflicts, right? Well, not exactly. Because what often happens is, uh, in reality, is pedestrians often ignore the overpass or underpass. They may be crossing at street level, even when it's not safe to do so, placing themselves in greater danger. As you can see here, one pedestrian in the street, another pedestrian just waiting to uh, step out. So uh, sometimes communities uh, may put up fences to try to keep people from crossing. Then pedestrians cut the fences or climb over the fences, and it just uh, doesn't work very well. So basically, grade separation is most useful for uh, purposes you know, beyond just simply crossing from one side of the street to the other, such as to connect buildings in urban areas, to connect different, totally different land uses, to cross freeways, uh, or cross major roads uh, connecting to light rail stations. And they're very expensive. Um, particularly, you can see here the long ramps that are required um, you know, to meet ADA requirements. And, and overpasses are very expensive in themselves. Now, undercrossings also have to be designed properly uh, so that people will use them. Pedestrians have to see the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, quite literally. And you can see here's one that's not designed very well. Uh, it's quite intimidating. And you can see the photograph of this pedestrian uh, who is not too happy as she came out of the tunnel uh, with the look there on her face. So here's an example of an elevated roadway, uh, actually on the University campus, University of Colorado. Uh, where it's very attractive, There's, uh, the crossing itself is uh, inviting, it's very uh, uh, well lit with natural sunlight, attractive, um, and uh, this gentleman is stopping to admire the artwork. So, you know, if they're done right, you know, undercrossings can work. Uh, you can see this one even has a skylight over it to get natural light uh, during the daytime. Okay, so overpasses and underpasses, we're saying should be a last resort because they're so expensive, try, try other options first. Um, because they add direction to travel. You know, who wants to climb a long ramp or even stairs to go on an overpass when they could cross the street level? Uh, when are they useful? Well, to connect different land uses separated by a major highway, like a freeway or interstate. How can you increase your effectiveness? Well, by providing more of a direct route, providing security, uh, but it is expensive. It's a very expensive option. In fact, here's a summary of sort of some of our uh, different devices we've talked about with costs and their effectiveness. Signing is fairly low cost, uh, but you're probably not going to solve a major safety problem with signing. High visibility crosswalks are a little better, a little more costly. Uh, advanced stop bars, uh, again, have some uh, fairly promising outcomes based on the research we've seen so far. Illumination can benefit pedestrians, certainly where pedestrians are uh, crossing streets at night. Raised median islands is a really good investment to improve pedestrian safety particularly where crashes are happening or crossing uh, four, five, six-lane roadways. Traffic signals are more expensive. If they're warranted, uh, they might be an appropriate solution in some cases. Um, and overpasses under crossings are very expensive and, again, a last resort. And certain, certainly choosing the proper location of one or more of these devices is priceless. And that's the key. Don't just pick one device and say, where can I put this device? You know, Go and, and analyze each problem and figure out what, it, what is the best solution. Okay, and, and I'll sort of close this part of it on engineering with saying that right design invites right use. If people are doing things that look dangerous, go look at the site and see how the road's designed or the things that can be done to the roadway environment to make it uh, more logical, safer, and so pedestrians and motorists uh, can operate in a, in a safer manner. Because uh, oftentimes, you know, we, we design wide streets and wonder why people are speeding. It's because we've designed them for high speeds. And then I want to add that many pedestrian crashes cannot be prevented by engineering treatments alone. Uh, many pedestrian crashes are the result of uh, erratic behavior by motorists or pedestrians or both, drunk drivers, uh, drivers on cell phones, pedestrians not paying attention. Uh, so uh, good pedestrian behavior and driver behavior need to start early. You know, certainly, you know, parents and teachers teaching children, uh, educating adults and seniors 
these are an example of six different kinds of uh, educational posters that were put on buses in Miami-Dade County. Uh, each, each of the six posters done in sequence over a several month period, uh, helping to educate pedestrians in Spanish, English, and Haitian Creole on sort of the safe ways to cross the street at night, at intersections, at mid-block, uh, uh, getting on and off buses, things of that type. Uh, here's an example of some uh, educational measures from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in English and Spanish, aimed at the older uh, Hispanic pedestrians. And certainly, uh, it's important that we uh, provide appropriate driver education and enforcement. And this kind of shows uh, an enforcement program in Miami-Dade County as part of this project. We were involved with a Miami-Dade pedestrian demo study, uh, and it was really an important uh, ingredient in reducing pedestrian crashes along certain corridors in South Florida. So really, yeah, there's a lot we can do with engineering, but you can't stop there. You have to also think about the education and enforcement. So if we can put all these different ideas together and try to pick the best solution for the site, then, then we have a chance to make things safer for pedestrians. So Jeremy, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you very much, Charlie. Um, we had a couple of minutes of the technical glitch, so um, we're just about at the end of our time, but we're going to go over a little bit. Um, it's about 10 minutes of questions here. Um, I think we were saved because we had a, a computer here that's running on wireless, um, and the, the network ca connection went down for the rest of our computers in our office. So um, thanks to wireless today, we kept going. And sorry for that pause earlier. Um, going to take a quick look at your questions and uh, start from the top. So our first, our first question um, is, do curb extensions lose effectiveness if there are bike lanes present? Ooh, yeah, good question. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, those have to be done carefully. You know, think about the road user for that given roadway. Um, I've seen some designs that do incorporate bike lanes with curb extensions, but you certainly uh, need to pick the curb extension design that, that doesn't uh, infringe on the, on the bike lane. So there are ways to do those designs, and, and we can probably you know, find some good examples of uh, some design plans from cities like Seattle and Portland that, that have, have uh, shown how to do this uh, properly. So Jeremy, is that something we can uh, maybe include in a follow-up to this? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Good question. Um, okay, uh, the next question is, do you have experience with mid-block crosswalks on major urban arterials with speeds of 40 to 50 miles per hour and three or more lanes of traffic in each direction separated by a wide median? Can you give us some recommendations? Uh, yes, okay, now that, that's a good one. Uh, in fact, that is a very similar situation to uh, uh, what I showed you from the, uh, uh, the hybrid pedestrian signal, the hawk signal, they're using in Tucson. I'd say that there are probably, again, two candidates of all the different treatments we talked about. Uh, if you're going to have uh, a relatively safe pedestrian crossing on this multi-lane, high speed, high volume, you know, those are pretty high speeds. Uh, it, it really kind of boils down to only one or two different options, it seems, from, from uh, what I've seen in, in the research and the guidelines. And that would be to, to determine whether a full-blown traffic signal is warranted, and possibly uh, the hawk signal, the pedestrian beacon. And again, there are, guide, there are um, criteria or warrants in the new MUTCD that should be looked at, along with the uh, full traffic signal warrants, to see whether the situation you're describing would meet the warrants for the pedestrian hybrid signal and or full signalization. But I would not recommend, <laughs> in that situation, just putting paint or not just paint with advanced warning signs, uh, because you know with those speeds, those high speeds of 40 to 50 miles an hour, uh, it really is going to take a lot to uh, get vehicles to come to a complete stop. So we really need to be looking at full signalization or possibly the uh, pedestrian uh, hawk uh, signal. Okay, thanks, Charlie. Um, so it's, it's winter time, and we have a good question here. Treatments? Can you talk about treatments for environments prone to significant snow and ice? Um, <clears throat> yeah, good question. I lived in Michigan seven years, and we had our share of that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that creates all kinds of problems, uh, certainly uh, at the crossings, but, you know, the sidewalks themselves. 
uh, and, and in snow belt countries, uh, Michigan where I live, Minnesota, uh, Maine, whatever, uh, I mean, some agencies have some fairly good policies on snow removal on sidewalks and on pedestrian crossings. Um, again, that's something that uh, we ought to do a little bit of searching to find some good uh, examples of case studies of how some agencies are handling that. But certainly snow removal you know, on pedestrian facilities needs to be a priority and not just removing snow on streets and dumping the snow you know, in, in, on the sidewalks and, and on the pedestrian uh, crossings. Thank you, Charlie. Um, there's a question about the Hawks. Why are, um, why are pedestrian hybrid beacons, the Hawks, better than installation of a traditional signal that is only activated when called by the pedestrian? Okay, no, good question. Um, okay, there, there's, a, there's probably about three different answers to that. Uh, number one, the Hawk signal, the way that it's timed is, um, first of all, it's, it's less expensive the way it's been used so far because there's not signalization on the side street. So it's a, a less expensive traffic signal. Uh, number two, it has a uh, sig signal sequence that reduces uh, motorist delay uh, compared to some traditional uh, traffic signals. Uh, number three, there's another benefit to it, and I'm trying to remember the, the version I showed you. So a lot of the Hawk signals that have been installed more recently in Tucson are very uh, visible, not only from the large signal heads, but also they have some supplemental signing that says crosswalk and stop for pedestrians. So that in itself um, uh, has, uh, makes these, that signal crossing more visible to motorists. In fact, some of the uh, uh, yielding behavior that, uh, of data that we collected and, and also collected by the Texas Transportation Institute at these devices shows that about 95% of motorists will actually stop on a red light at a hawk, whereas uh, a lower percentage will stop at a red light for a standard pedestrian signal, believe it or not. So it actually has higher compliance. In fact, the TTI study found that about a 60% reduction in pedestrian crashes uh, uh, compared before and after these uh, hawks were installed where there had previously been like an overhead warning sign. So more effective, less delay, less costly. Okay. Um, uh, now you showed us uh, um, the new um, pedestrian crosswalk ahead sign. Now, is this crosswalk ahead sign required for unsignalized crossings, and does the placement of a crosswalk ahead sign vary depending on posted speed? Uh, good question. First answer, it's not a required sign uh, at all unsignalized crossings. Uh, the METCD, I'm just looking at the wording this morning again, um, it does give a fair amount of discretion to the engineer to decide you know, when and where to use these. Um, I think the second part of that was the placement of it. Uh, does it depend on the speed limit? And, and the answer would be generally yes. Uh, there's a section of the METCD that does give recommended distances for the uh, advanced signing based on speed limit. So yes. Okay. Uh, let's take one more question here. Um, this one's interesting. How do you get state highway departments who are used to a most cars in the least time mindset to come to the local municipality's point of view that bike ped safety should be paramount? Ooh, <laughs> good question. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this, this, is a, this is an issue that a lot of uh, local agencies have, uh, have been facing. Um, I, I would start out by saying that um, I, I think that there's a real value in training and education, uh, particularly, you know, to you know, engineers and planners that, that may not uh, be enlightened, so to speak, with uh, uh, the understanding the need for you know, safe pedestrian facilities. Uh, I would add uh, that there's a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, not only are some of these devices in the MUTCD and in the uh, AASHTO pedestrian guide, so AASHTO uh, uh, promotes some of these things uh, in the F8 Federal Highway Administration, <clears throat> but many of these states that are not promoting safe pedestrian crossings actually may have uh, some of their own guidelines uh, may re require or recommend some of these pedestrian treatments. Uh, if they don't, that's something that needs to be looked at. But, but there's also training. In fact, uh, I'll use this as a, uh, a, co a commercial opportunity, that there are training courses that are offered by the Pedestrian Bike Information Center for Federal Highway Administration, uh, several courses, on to try to uh, educate people on, on the value of 
providing for pedestrians, and better ways to do that. And we don't, I mean, we basically teach stuff that's right out of the AASHTO and uh, guidelines, MUTCD, the, the latest research, uh, best practices. Uh, one of the, the courses is called Designing for Pedestrian Safety. In fact, most of the slides I've used here today are taken from that course and modified. Uh, we have another course. Uh, that course is aimed at engineers, planners, uh, as well as educators, health professionals, uh, police. Uh, we have another course called How to Develop a Pedestrian Safety Action Plan. It's sort of a more general course that talks about strategies for uh, you know, how you get funding to make pedestrian improvements, how you analyze data to identify pedestrian crash and safety problems, how you select countermeasures, uh, what are some of the, the details of the engineering, education, and enforcement. Uh, and sort of put it all together in a package. In fact, that course recommends that each uh, state and local agency develop their own unique pedestrian safety action plan. So that's a two-day course. We have a three-day combined course, which sort of combines the best information from those two two-day courses. And each of those involves one or two sort of in-field workshop where you look at a site, you come up with recommended changes in, in the design or the signal timing or the roadway design or uh, policies that agency has. And then there's another course <clears throat> that, that's a one-day course. It's called uh, Creating Livable Communities Through Public Involvement. And that course is really uh, the first one that we've developed that is directed more at advocates, at uh, health professionals, and at business leaders or developers in the community. So it brings those folks together with engineers and planners uh, to sort of talk about you know, how the, the groups can work together more effectively because uh, you know, many times we want the same goals, even though we have different ways uh, to go about getting them. So, so anyway, if you're interested in hearing more about the training, actually we have some uh, details on our website, uh, www.walkinginfo.org slash training. Slash training. Uh, or you can just scroll down to the cover page and click on the, the, the courses. It's got a, a link to those, and it tells you all about the courses. Uh, if you're interested in finding out more, you know, get in touch with Jeremy or myself, uh, respond you know, to the website, and we'll uh, call and we can talk about sort of what, what, which course might be appropriate uh, for your agency. Okay. Um, how about one more question? Okay, sure. This one's interesting, and um, uh, sorry we're keeping everyone over time, but there's so many great questions that everyone asked that we just never had a chance to get to. Um, this one comes from uh, Virginia DOT. Are there any studies on in-pavement flashing beacons? Yes. And what was the outcome? Yeah. I knew I was going to get that question. <laughs> Thank you, Virginia. Uh, no, uh, there are some, a few studies done on that. In fact, uh, I just had one of our researchers do a summary of, of the research that was done on in-pavement flashing lights. Uh, first, let me tell you that I checked this morning to, make, to see if in-pavement flashing lights were still in the, uh, the new manual. It is. It's under the uh, traffic signals section, of all things. Uh, it's, a, it's a beacon, but it's considered a, a signal. Uh, so it is still an allowable device. Um, and there has been a limited amount of research that has looked at things like uh, uh, conducting surveys. Do pedestrians like the in-pavement flashing lights? Uh, looking at conflicts and the distance away that motorists yield uh, to pedestrians in crosswalks with those. And uh, without spending two hours discussing it, uh, Jeremy wouldn't let me do that, but basically there's some mixed results. Uh, we have certainly seen uh, some evidence that there's been some maintenance issues with some of them, you know, that they're installed and, and they, they break. They don't work very well or they have to undergo uh, regular maintenance work. So there's the, there's the in, uh, insulation cost that's, uh, you know, uh, well, you can look at the, the prices, but it's not insignificant. And then there are potential maintenance issues with some devices. I'm not, not saying with all. Uh, the effectiveness has not been looked at in terms of pedestrian crashes. It has been looked at in terms of behaviors, and, and the results are very mixed. Um, if anybody wants to see kind of a summary of the research on in-pavement flashing lights, uh, it was done by Libby Thomas of our group. I think it's a very fair, balanced uh, analysis of uh, what we know about in-pavement flashing lights, uh, we'll be glad to uh, you know, link that article online as well. Okay. 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 Well, um, and I guess that's all the time we do have for questions today. We ran a little over. Um, and thank you so much for sending all the questions that you do have. Um, there's lots of great ones unanswered, un unfortunately. Um, and uh, if we didn't get your question today and something is, um, you'd really like to, to find out some more, 
don't hesitate to contact us. Um, my email address is webinars at hsrc.unc.edu. And you can call me at 919-843-4859. Uh, before we end, I want to point you to some related resources compiled and produced by PBIC that we'll be posting these um, on the archive page of today's webinar. Um, you can check out the engineering section of our website, um, www.walkinginfo.org slash engineering, where we describe a wide range of engineering solutions. Um, you can also browse a selection of frequently asked questions developed by PBIC under the subject heading engineering. And of course, Charlie mentioned the um, two and three day training courses that we offer, which you can find at walkinginfo.org slash training. And I want to remind you that you will be able to access a recording and transcript of today's program, as well as view a PDF, PDF copy of the slides. So um, hopefully um, your agencies will find that helpful. On this page, on the webinars page, you will also be able to register for the next Livable Communities webinar, Community Approaches to Pedestrian Safety Education, scheduled for Thursday, March 18th from 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m with Dr. Jillian Hutt, who is with the WalkSafe program in Miami-Dade that Charlie mentioned earlier, and, uh, and also David Parisi. And finally, I, I want to remind you that a very brief survey will appear once the webinar has ended. And again, we very much appreciate you taking a moment to complete it. Thank you um, to our speaker, Charlie Zagir. Thanks to all of you for attending today's webinar, and, and thanks for bearing with us through our technical difficulties. Have a great afternoon. Yeah, thanks, everyone.